Right, good morning everyone and, and, and welcome to this meeting on the Learning in a Digital Age Leader Community Learning Hubs Initiative. Um, it's, it's great to have colleagues from uh, around the world and without further ado, uh, I think we'll just do a quick round of introductions, you know, let us know who you are and, and, and where you're from and I will take it based on the order I have in front of me. Um, so I'll hand the microphone, oh, and, and when you're not speaking, if you can just mute your microphones, uh, and you know, just remember to activate your mic when you um, join the conversation. So the first I have on my list is AO254. I'm not sure who that is. <laughs> my name is Aida, Dr. Wei. Oh, hi, Aida, that's hi, you, Aida. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, welcome. Uh, using the one is using my staff number. I, Asia University AEU. So yeah, Ada is from the Asia <laughs> uh, E University, based out of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, and uh, next on my list, I have Becca. Hi everybody. Um, I'm from Christchurch, New Zealand. Hi Claire. Claire and I used to work together. Um, I'm the manager of learning design here at the uh, a Polytechnic in Christchurch. But I, I'm going to stop the video and also apologize because I need to leave a few minutes early. So. Okay, Becca. Uh, I understood that. I am recording, so I will share this with the group uh, after the fact. Um, and I should also mention that uh, ARA uh, Institute of Technology is also a founding partner of the National Center for Open Education Practice here at New Zealand, which we're getting off the ground. So um, next on my list is Claire. Oops, good morning everyone. Uh, my name's Claire, I'm with the learning and teaching development team at Otago Polytechnic in Dunedin, in New Zealand. Kia ora Claire, and um, seconded for part of your time helping uh, OER, you do its uh, things, right? Yep, absolutely. And uh, next on my list, uh, Dave. Hello all, I'm Dave Lane. Um, I'm also based as Becca is in Christchurch, although we don't cross paths very much these days. Yeah, so Christchurch, New Zealand, about four hours north of where Claire and Wayne are. And here, by the way, it is 14 degrees and uh, the sun is out, my laundry is drying, but it's meant to start raining any, any time now. I'm, I'm the open source technologist for the OER Foundation, and I'm just interested to see what you all have to talk about today. Cheers. Thanks very much, Dave. Uh, next on my list, I have Hanin, ha, Hanani. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hello from Malaysia. I am from Asia E University. Uh, well, it's a public holiday over here in Kuala Lumpur. The whole nation is on a public holiday, so oh, all of us are <laughs> all of us and, are and, online. And, oh, and, and thank you kindly for your dedication to join the OERU discussion on a public <laughs> holiday. Thank always you. look, always look forward to. <laughs> thank you. Uh, next on the list is Lynn from Vancouver. Lynn, I think you might be muted. So I think I'm the new kid on the block, block here. <laughs> so coming to you from Vancouver um, and we're the Polytechnic University, Quantum Polytechnic University, um, and I look after the learning centres here. So we're into learning support, but um, very much into an open ed approach to learning support. Yep. And, and welcome, Lynn. Um, we, we won't question you about your former allegiances to Australia, uh, <laughs> given our situation in New Zealand. Um, moving on. <laughs> we um, forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Uh, Nefadila Aziz. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fadila from Asia E University. Uh, in here in Kuala Lumpur. I'm sorry I can share my video with all of you. We just woke up. It's a public holiday here in Malaysia. Everyone is celebrating uh, the, the new king's coronation and I just woke up so I can only hear you. I can only hear you so I'm not going to share my uh, camera. Sorry. Fair enough and again thank you for uh, volunteering some of your public holiday time to be with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Next on the list, uh, 
Hello everyone, uh, I'm Rachel from the University of Tasmania. I work in the field of academic development, so I help people design and redesign units and courses. And at the moment, we're ready to launch our second um, OERU uh, short course. Yeah, and I must say, um, it's looking very good. So we, we're excited to, uh, to see this, the contribution and particularly its close relation to the um, um, Sustainable Development Goal. So we're very excited about that course. Absolutely. Um, and back across the Pacific to Rajiv. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rajiv Jangiani. I've uh, been a course developer for a couple of institutions at the OERU. Uh, but in my current role, I'm the Associate Vice Provost for Open Education uh, at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. So you've already met Lynn. I have the privilege of being her colleague. And at the moment, I'm one floor above her. Here we go. Thanks, Rajiv. And I'm pleased you could make it. Um, uh, it's, always, it's always a challenge finding a time that suits all these international time zones. And at, at this point, it's appropriate that I should uh, uh, ask Ramesh to introduce himself because he's got up at 5 a.m. this morning and we're most appreciative. Uh, uh, Ramesh? Uh, hello. Namaste, everyone. I'm Ramesh Sharma. And uh, currently, I'm working with Ambedkar University in New Delhi. Previously, I was working with Vavasan Open University. And uh, I have the privilege to work with Wayne uh, on various uh, uh, fronts, uh, uh, at VK Educator in Commonwealth of Learning, like that. I have been Regional Director of Indira Gandhi National Open University for a long time. And uh, I love, love work in the field of open educational resources. So it's nice to be here. Uh, and I look forward to work closely with everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, and thank you very much again, Ramesh, for taking the time so early out in the morning. And I should just mention that Ramesh has been instrumental in moving the OERU outreach uh, initiative in India, uh, having recruited no fewer than five institutions in India who have joined as uh, outreach partners. And we, we're very excited about that initiative. Uh, so thank you again, Ramesh. Okay, and uh, the last person I have on my list here, Namaste. Uh, the last person I have on my list here is Cheryl. Cheryl, it looks like your microphone is still uh, muted. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay. My name is Cheryl Shazwani from Asia University, Malaysia. Same with Hanani and Dr. Ada. Hello. Thank you, Cheryl. You're most welcome. And again, we appreciate you sacrificing your public holiday uh, to be with us. Yeah, thank you. Right. So I have I, I think I've got everyone. I, have I missed anyone? If I've missed anyone oh, who's Wayne, at the I'm meeting. A late, I'm, a, I'm a late edition, Wayne. Carmel O'Sullivan from USQ here. <laughs> Oh, Carmel, I'm so pleased you could make it. We had a, a bit of a glitch when you had registered on the expression of interest. The apostrophe for O'Sullivan wasn't included in the email address. And when I sent out the invitations, I didn't notice that. And so I do apologize for the short notice. And I'm very no, pleased you could okay. join us. I'm glad I can be here. I can actually only be here for another 20 minutes because um, I've got a clash, but I'm really happy to be here. So I'm from the University of Southern Queensland in Australia. Um, I'm the director of the library, um, but we do have a keen interest in open education practice here. Wonderful. You're most welcome, Carmel. Right, so I'll quickly start a screen share and get the uh, agenda up that I posted last night. Uh, there we go. Coming to you. Right. Okay, so just very briefly, uh, I, I thought I'd just give a little bit of background uh, to this uh, Community Learning Hub initiative, where it's come from, and uh, some of the thoughts that we have uh, around this initiative. Um, so what this is really about is to have a look at ways in which we can 
increase the reusability of our learning in the digital age courses. Uh, so as you may well know, we have uh, four micro courses uh, which make up the learning in a digital age uh, course at the OERU. Learning in a digital age has been approved for credit transfer in the US, in Canada, and the United Kingdom. Um, and as you know, the OERU model, we assemble all our courses as micro courses. We have the four uh, learning in a digital age micro courses there, which are really designed to support uh, and promote digital literacies or digital fluencies, depending on your preferred nomenclature uh, for academic purposes. Um, and because we have each of these courses available as micro courses, we also offer micro credentials uh, for assessed learning for each of those micro courses. And if a learner completes the uh, required number of micro courses, for example, three micro courses for a three credit course in North America, or four micro courses for a 15 or 16 credit course in Australia, New Zealand, uh, they would qualify for transcript credit. We have also uh, uh, implementing uh, an executive decision here at Otago Polytechnic by the executive leadership team uh, to make learning, uh, learning in a digital age available as an elective course for all degrees at Otago Polytechnic which have electives at the first year level. So we are also progressing wider adoption here at Otago Polytechnic. Um, what I also just quickly wanted to point out here, this is the main landing page on the OERU.org website for these courses. And true to our philosophy of openness, we believe that learners should be able to access all course materials without the need to register an account. If a learner clicks on the Start Learning button, they will be taken directly to the uh, relevant micro course website where they will be able to uh, proceed with their studies of the individual learning pathways without having to register an account, which is quite important for us. But at the same time, uh, learners could, if they wanted to express uh, interest in joining uh, any one of the micro courses. And basically how this works, if a learner clicks on the, you know, sign up, it's free button, uh, they can uh, opt in uh, to uh, receive email instructions for when, you know, the, the independent study courses start or in the case of COVID. So we would then uh, assign them to an email campaign to receive, um, you know, courses. Of course, we, we take the general data protection requirements very seriously. Uh, we use an opt-in system, making sure that whenever a learner signs up for anything, they know exactly what they're signing up for. So we make it very clear at the point of registration that you will be signing up to receive, you know, the course emails. Um, or the, the course instructions via email. Uh, what I also just wanted to point out, there are different lead capture pages for different purposes. So I just wanted to convey at this stage the notion that there are different places where a learner can express interest in joining a course. Um, they could also, for example, if they visit the actual course materials, uh, they have the ability to actually register on the course site uh, where we make uh, additional technologies available to those learners, for example, being able to comment on the course website and so forth. Um, a little bit of background in terms of how the course was developed. We uh, it started out by uh, looking at OERU partners that offered similar courses in their curriculum. Uh, in the early days, and you know, we put together a, a big can board of all these uh, different sections and cu uh, curriculum areas that were covered in similar courses. And then, with the help of Gronja Canol, uh, who many of you would know from the e-learning world, uh, assisted us in a, a community source uh, initiative where we went out on social media asking folk who work in these spaces what they would want to include in a course like this. And uh, we then, you know, after that process, we were able to develop the curriculum, which has then been approved for, you know, credit transfer to a number of institutions. That's kind of the high level background of the actual learning in the digital age courses. 
Um, at the 2017 partners meeting, we uh, initiated the idea of uh, following peer-to-peer -peer universities' example of their learning, learning circle model, where they work with community libraries and university libraries to offer face-to-face -face support for the, uh, a, a number of MOOCs uh, around the world. And it, it's a very, very powerful model of you know, widening uh, learning opportunities with face-to-face -face support. Of course, there are a number of uh, challenges with the commercial MOOC providers who are slowly trying to uh, commercialize their models and shutting down uh, unrestricted access to their courses. But it is a model which we could potentially replicate uh, at OERU. Um, at the 2018 partners meeting in Port Macquarie, Australia, we took a decision uh, to implement community learning hubs as an innovation pilot uh, using LEADER. Um, and that's kind of where this has all come from. We then had a number of implementation delays in terms of moving this forward. In part was a total redesign of our automated MORTIC campaigns to, to support learners. So at the OERU, we use a piece of open source software called MORTIC which is really a customer relationships management engine uh, or automated marketing system that enables us to send out the course uh, instructions via email and automate this process on the back end. I mean, you'll appreciate as the OERU is rolling out two full years of uh, study at the first year level for a small nonprofit organization like the OER Foundation with only two staff members, we have to think of ways in which we can automate these processes on the back end. And uh, you know, we use MORTIC for this, this purpose. So I thought I'd just show you, just give you a high level overview of the kind of logic that uh, is used on the back end to automate uh, these emails that are going out. Um, here, here is an example of a flow chart that is used to uh, implement the MORTI campaigns we use on the back end uh, for sending out the course instructions. I mean, obviously learners can, we, we can you know, advertise the availability of a course on you know, social media, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, site notice on Wiki Educator, uh, or our Google Ads grant program where we uh, get a grant from Google uh, to advertise OERU courses, which direct learners to the landing page I've just shown you. And based on decisions learners take, you know, they either go to the course materials directly and don't register, or they may sign up for one of the, on one of the landing pages. And based on those decisions, uh, we then implement how these email campaigns operate. I mean, we've also had uh, instances where we've experimented with actual paid advertising uh, through Google. And uh, under the Google Grants program, there's a requirement that we need, we, we can't use the same landing pages uh, that the Google Grants program uses for paid advertising. So we have to have different landing pages for that purpose. And this of course complicates, uh, you know, how we design the, the email distribution campaigns. So I don't want to go into all the detail of what's happening here, other than to say, we had to do quite a bit of work over the last couple of months to uh, reconfigure and redesign our campaigns. But the short message here is this gives us the ability to uh, run cohort-based instances of uh, OERU courses as well as um, you know, the independent study options. And so the systems are designed to address the, you know, the kinds of problems that you, you would encounter that if, for example, a learner signed up to join the cohort offering starting on the 7th of August, what the systems need to do if the learner three days later decides to join the independent study cohort and, and how the systems then ad administer the outgoing emails. So those processes are all automated on the back end. And I just wanted to it, you know, just illustrate this so that you know there's been a lot of work happening behind the scenes, which hasn't been immediately obvious uh, to all our OERU partners. So let me just leave that there. Um, that was in terms of the 
work we've done on the redesign of the Morty campaigns. We've also done quite a bit, and this has been uh, where Dave has been helping us out. He's uh, developed a plug-in for managing registrations on the course site. And there's quite a bit of uh, intelligence happening here because uh, if a learner registers here on the WordPress site, uh, automatically on the back end, the, the contacts would be associated with the relevant MORTIC campaigns for automating the email instructions. We've also got new software features for learners to register their blog feeds, uh, URLs for harvesting, and um, that is now all integrated. So there's been a bunch of code development on the back end as well to support what we're doing. Uh, that is in terms of where, where we're at. What has also happened since we last spoke has been the launch of the New Zealand National Centre for um, Open Education Practice. Uh, we are launching this national collaboration and we've got a couple of projects on the go, one of which is to make a cohort offering of the Learning in the Digital Age courses available to every New Zealand learner. And um, because we have this cohort offering happening in New Zealand, we can of course open this up to all learners worldwide. And we have um, you know, a number of participants from a good number of countries who will be joining the next cohort. Um, I also want to mention that OERU partner institutions can join as international founding members of the National Centre if you're interested at no cost. And of course, all individuals from around the world are most welcome to join this initiative if you want to keep up to date and, and, and see what we're doing here. So that's just an open uh, invitation that if you do want to join uh, this uh, initiative, please just sign up and we'll keep you up to date with what's happening here. <laughs> Um, but I just mentioned this because the cohort we are offering means that you could make this available, the cohort starting on the 7th of August, to all your learners or staff at your institutions. So um, if you feel that uh, you have learners that could benefit from these courses, please let them know that this cohort is running. Uh, it is free. I've included a poster there that you can distribute freely uh, to you know, uh, promote uh, participation in the course. The only other thing I wanted to mention, which I forgot, is uh, we are also launching a digital literacy subscription and sponsorship initiative for institutions who are not partners of the OER uh, collaboration. Uh, for a nominal fee of uh, 295 US dollars, we will make available the uh, competency test in copyright uh, and Creative Commons licensing to subscription partners. So if you do know of any institutions that want to test the OERU waters without becoming full partners, we have that option available. Uh, but of course, our full OERU partners will get uh, free access to that uh, competency test, uh, which you could have uh, make available locally at your own institution should you want to. So that's just kind of a high level summary of where NIDA has come from, what we are doing, um, and maybe I should just open the floor now for any questions uh, before we continue. Any questions? I'll wait a bit. If I don't hear anything, we'll follow the OERU principle of silence means assent. Yep, no questions from me. Yep. Um, Hanani, do you have a question? Yeah, <laughs> you know, you mentioned about the Center for Open Education Practice just now. You said yeah. it's open for the other, um, what do you call that, education practitioner? So how, yes, how absolutely. Do, how did they go about to join? Uh, it's quite easy. You just go to, I've included the link on the agenda there. It's the Center for Open Education Practice link. You just go to the website and uh, you, you sign up as an individual uh, if, okay. if it's an uh, OERU partner. So you'll just complete the form, you sign up, and then you'll be listed as a founding a member of the initiative. So it's just simply completing the form, and you'll be able to join. Okay. You got it. Any other questions? No.
Right, I'll take silence to mean assent and then we can move on with the main body of the agenda. So one of the ideas that we have is um, to develop a set of ancillary resources, which could be um, you know, slideshow presentations or perhaps even lesson plans for institutions, both mem uh, member institutions and uh, digital uh, sponsorship institutions to offer face-to-face -face support sessions uh, in conjunction with the independent study learning in a digital age courses. Um, we could, for example, have uh, uh, you know, university libraries or community libraries uh, offering, say, a single face-to-face uh, -face contact session every week uh, for each of the uh, micro courses. So each of the micro courses are designed for independent study over two to three weeks. So uh, each micro course could, for example, accommodate a single face-to-face -face, uh, session. And what we're wanting to do is using, you know, open collaboration, develop these ancillary support resources, of course, openly licensed to make it easy for any library or community library or any institution to offer a face-to-face -face session uh, in support of these courses. So um, that is the general high-level idea, and I want to open the floor to hear your thoughts and ideas on this proposal. Anyone, don't be shy. At this stage, you're not committing to any work. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Wayne. I have one question. Hi, Ada. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, you mentioned that you are uh, going to provide the face-to-face -face sessions for the microcourses. Is it for the whole microcourses? Or how about the program structure? So, so the, the idea is to... Uh, develop resources to enable anyone to run face-to-face -face sessions in support of the learning in the digital age courses. So whether it's me offering a face-to-face -face session locally to Otago Polytechnic learners, or for example, yourself uh, making, uh, offering a face-to-face -face, uh, su support session for HAE university students, uh, either for the, the library program. But the idea is that we work together on developing the resources to make it easy for anybody that is calling a face-to-face -face session to have those resources available. Does that make sense, Ada? Okay. So it means that we can have a collaborative sessions, it means uh, there can be multiple people uh, providing that sessions in one course. Eh? Absolutely, yes. That, that, that's the thing. Well, that was my thinking or idea. I, I wonder what others think of that. Um, I think that's, that's a really great idea. And it's a way of um, getting some of the issues that I'm finding at my institution is uh, because the members of the institution haven't created um, the course themselves, there seems to be um, some issues around that as far as um, whether it's fit for purpose. So I think offering that option, Wayne, where you can get some buy-in um, and some collaborative input uh, to make it, I guess, more um, locally relevant is a great idea. Yeah. Oh, I, I thought the not invented here syndrome was only a condition of New Zealand's, but so I'm, I'm pleased to hear you, you, you're having similar issues uh, in Aussie. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and part of the thing, I mean, learning in a digital age is quite a generic course. I mean, very often, I mean, these are really information literacy skills, which uh, is really falls within, you know, the work of libraries as well. So the, the thinking here is, you know, they, they, these offerings need not necessarily be for formal academic credit. You know, they could just be additional support materials for, you know, learners who are wanting to, you know, brush up their knowledge in any one of these areas. And the micro course format makes it possible for 
you know, institutions to pick and choose. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be all the micro courses. There might be one that particularly has a good fit uh, for addressing local needs or could perhaps even be integrated into an existing course. So, you know, it's, it's really about, you know, the reuse scenario. Um, and, you know, by working together, we can figure out how we could potentially do this. So, yeah, that makes sense. And it's Lynn here. Any other thoughts? We, hi, Lynn. Hi. We offer um, online tutoring and online workshops at the moment through the Learning Centre. And when I think about the concept here, um, I think it would probably be something that our learning strategists, you know, if we attach this to our Learning Centre website, you know, that people could access this um, course, then it would be more than feasible for our learning strategists to provide that ongoing coaching or tutoring or support at that level, whether it be mm -hmm. for a small group or for individuals. So that right. would be a normal part of service to anybody with a KPU student number, but not necessarily the general public. And un un understood, yeah, and yeah, and I, I mean, I, I, you, I mean, that could work rather well. I mean, given the OERU model, we we don't place any restrictions, uh, mm -hmm. and our our mission is really about working in ways, working within existing institutional policy and in existing institutional, uh, you know, systems, in ways that you know, help the institution achieve what they're already achieving. So, I mean, there's no requirement for engaging, you know, community libraries, for example. However, you know, other part, I, I for example, am going to reach out to our local community libraries here with the Dunedin City Council and see if there's interest with our community libraries uh, in, you know, supporting the wider population. Because the beauty is these courses can be offered free of charge. But at the same time, you know, given its open licensing requirements, KPU, for example, I mean, could offer the course as a full fee service course. I mean, if it were approved locally, you could charge learners, you know, registration fees if you wanted to. Um, but the learning strategist idea sounds, you know, sounds like a good place to start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, just on that uh, discussion around um, tertiary students engaging in, um, you know, the micro course as opposed to community members, something um, that I found a little bit challenging, if, if the course is recognised as something that can be credit bearing in an undergraduate course, it's automatically deemed not fit for purpose for community members that um, um, might not be um, prepared or might not have the requirements for university study. And so probably the place that this course would fit best for our students is in the pre-degree community space. Um, however, I, I found it challenging to mount an argument given that um, it's, it's recognised at undergraduate level. I don't know if other places have experienced that kind of challenge. Yeah, yeah absolutely, Rachel. I, I, I can see the challenge. Uh, you know, at some institutions um, um, may have more difficulty in recognising it for formal academic credit than others, and that's fine. Uh, if, you know, learners, you know, um, can participate in the learning, you know, either, you know, for a digital badge, participation badge, uh, sort of at the pre-degree level, you know, that's fine. Because um, we have actually resolved the full credit piece. Um, you know, it's, it's already uh, accredited in one, one, two, three, in four countries. So I'm, 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 not, I'm not concerned about the, the full credit piece, but at the same time, there will be aspects of these courses that will be extremely valuable at the pre-degree level. Um, so, for example, in New Zealand, there are one or two schools uh, who are making this course available for these senior uh, uh, school students at, in, at, at the high school level uh, as, you know, kind of an in introductory to sort of a university level course. So, yeah, I mean, all those options are available. I mean, I, I guess it's, you know, picking the one that is likely more likely to succeed in your own context and environment. Yeah, yeah. Any, 
Any other thoughts and contributions from anybody else? Uh, of late, I have been going for uh, various uh, workshops in India, almost most of the places, because the University Grants Commission of India, they have uh, stressed on the faculty development program. And uh, the government of India, uh, two, three years ago, developed a MOOC platform. It is named as SWAYAM, S-W-A-Y-A-M, which is a short of a study web of active young mind learners. And then they want to promote uh, digital education so that uh, more of the learners, the teachers, they can create their free courses. Means for the uh, students, uh, you don't need to pay for them. And then, uh, you know, the government is uh, has also allowed, uh, but it's at present for the Indian MOOCs which have been developed, up to 20% of the credit uh, transfer for their. And I have been in my presentations taking sessions on open educational resources. That's why it has generated a lot of uh, interest uh, uh, among our, uh, you know, teacher, teacher colleagues from there. So in my yeah. presentations, uh, I'm now thinking that uh, 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 means in my face-to-face -face sessions, I'll also be taking up these LIDA uh, 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 courses and the content so that uh, the students, they can also, or our faculty participants, uh, they can also develop those relevant skills and update their knowledge about how the things they are, you know, at uh, the, in the modern times they are taking up. So, yeah, I think I, I'll be going to do that. Sounds like a good idea, Ramesh. And, and you know, given the open licensing and sort of uh, open source technologies that we use for all our courses, there would be no restrictions for any of this content being, uh, you know, hosted on the Indian MOOC platform. Uh, I mean, that's the purpose of, you know, we are, it's, you know, think finding ways to maximize reuse. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I don't have the uh, link here uh, with me right now. Dave, maybe you you can uh, find it. But one of the initiatives that really sparked the idea of these com uh, community learning hub uh, initiatives was um, uh, an example from India where uh, a local person in the community ran a face-to-face -face workshop on Women's Day using Learning in a, a Leader 101. Um, and, and it really just illustrated the, you know, the power of, you know, by making these courses openly available, anybody in the community uh, could yeah. use them to, you know, provide, provide local support. So, um, yes, I, I mean, I think it's an excellent idea. Yeah. And uh, when we create any uh, learning resource, uh, either in terms of, uh, say, a PowerPoint presentation or uh, 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 animation or a video, something like that, we will share with everyone. And uh, others, they can Absol also absolutely make yeah. Of that. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I mean, one one of the things I'm I'm sitting thinking of is you know around. You know, slideshows, for example, that, you know, we use uh, an open technology, maybe something like Reveal.js, which is an HTML-based uh, technology uh, that we can, you know, develop reusable slides that can be, uh, you know, reused and rebranded and re-templated for, you know, for different purposes. So, I mean, we can get into the detail as we move forward. Um, but uh, basically, I mean, I think it's a good idea to move forward and, you're really just extending an open invitation to, any, to anybody who wants to be engaged in this process uh, that you're most welcome to join us. Um, one way we could uh, possibly do this, I, I, will, I will set up a, a group list on our community site um, and then you know, send out an invitation to you know, all who are present here uh, you know, just to join that community list which we can use for the planning discussions. So I mean, it's an opt-in process, I'll send the invitation, and then you can decide if, you know, you want to be part of this, you can just join those discussions, and, um, you know, we move forward and, and see where we go. Uh, you know, does that make sense? Yes. 
uh, Wayne, just quickly interrupting for a moment. I, I posted a link to the picture that we got uh, of the group of people in Kerala um, who were combined or who got themselves organized to take uh, the LIDA course together. So that's in the chat if anybody hasn't seen it yet. Oh, thanks for that, Dave. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with Zoom at the bottom of your screen, if you bring uh, your mouse all over your mouse to the bottom of the video uh, display, you'll see a chat uh, bubble. And if you click on that, you can access the, the chat channel. So that's the uh, example from Kerala. Um, one thing I've been thinking about, Wayne, and, and maybe um, Rachel is helpful with the problem of buy-in is um, with the leader course especially I think it could be brought to a um, targeted group if, if there's say a group of learners who are all interested in I don't know what it might be um, photography or architecture or um, tourism uh, leader could be contextualized around um, you know go and find these materials on tourism in your local area and look at the credibility uh, relevance currency that sort of thing yeah. for example so um, because of their very broad nature it actually makes them more open to adaptation if that makes sense yeah, no, uh, totally understand. And I mean, we, we, we could have variants of leader that are designed for particular audiences uh, at one level, and it would be relatively trivial to do that, just given how we've designed and set up the courses, number one. The other aspect, which I think is um, quite interesting in the space, the fact that we're running this cohort for New Zealand means we've actually piloted and developed these systems for setting up cohort based instances uh, in terms of automating the processes on the back end so for example if uh, quantum polytechnic university wanted to run a cohort for their learner community it would be relatively easy to set up the back end technologies to administer a cohort offering uh, independently of you know the independent study that is happening you know all year round so i mean We've got all those options uh, available to us, and you know, yeah, this, is, this is open source, and we also um, let's experiment and you know, make the world a better place. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Yeah, good idea. Any other thoughts? Um, I just um, in response to the like customization for particular cohorts or making it more discipline uh, specific or relevant. I suppose um, you know while that could have merit, I constantly see uh, things like that coming up as a reason why not to to engage or get on board with something. Um, and I just think before launching into doing things like that, we need to be careful that we're putting our energies into something that's got merit, not appeasing the, the blockers who, once you, you put yeah. the energy into yeah. doing that, they'll find another reason why to say it's not fit for purpose because yeah. that kind of yeah. discipline specific constantly comes up. Um, and with something like this, I think, it's really strong in the fact that it is discipline neutral and that it is accessible and sustainable. Um, so yeah, I just think we need to act with caution as far as whether people are, are blockers or genuinely wanting to contribute or make something better or more relevant. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I agree with I'll you. Totally I, I Rachel, but... Sorry, Wayne. Carry on, Claire, carry on. Yeah. I wouldn't see it as um, amending uh, the materials, the, the course content at all, but for the face-to-face -face sessions, they could easily be adapted, I think. I, I completely uh, agree uh, with what you're saying around, you know, we can do everything we 
you know, with, with all the best intentions and the best will in the world, there are some people who are not going to um, want to engage for whatever reason. And we just need to get on with those people who do want to. So, um, yeah. But I just think yeah. you know, the face-to-face -face ones could be um, adapted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that clear is actually a very good suggestion um, because leader has been designed in such a way that it is quite generic and it, it does uh, it has implemented pedagogy of discovery which enables learners to pursue and find the resources that are relevant to their own contexts but I really like the idea of being able to have you know sort of customized versions of sort of the face-to-face -face sessions which would be relatively easy to you know building those customizations for particular cohorts. So, I mean, I think that's a good idea. But I also note Rachel's uh, concerns. You, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, the, 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 the showstoppers of this world can find reasons to uh, put blockages in the way. But interestingly enough, it's a problem that we've solved in the open source software development community. I mean, and that's the beauty of the open source model. Anybody has the freedom to what we call in open source software development to fork a project and create their own derivative version uh, of you know any particular initiative um, and everybody has the freedom to do that and what we've learned in the sort of the open source software world is there's always a critical mass you, know, you, you need a critical mass of contributors who share a particular idea uh, in you know taking something forward and if the so-called showstoppers want to fork uh, and, and, you know, leader for their own purposes, if they don't have critical mass, they're not going to succeed. Um, but we're not restricting their freedom in any way. So I'm just uh, going to ask if there are any more uh, questions or, or, or contributions uh, from the floor. And then what I might do is, that in terms of next steps, is 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 really just set up the uh, discussion list or discussion form where we can, uh, you know, progress ideas, thoughts, and and you know we'll do this in the true open source, open collaboration way, and let the community lead us in you know where we're going, uh, you know, around taking this forward. Is is that a good way, uh, or, or a good way for moving forward? Do you think? I see thumbs up from <laughs> uh, from Malaysia. Uh, that's good, great. Uh, one of the Canadians have got some thumbs up, so that's great. And I'm not sure I'm seeing every, everybody's thumbs. The ones anybody who's got a, 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 a thumb pointing downwards, I can't see it, so it's going unnoticed. <laughs> great. Any last Great. All right, everyone, I really appreciate your time this morning and uh, particularly uh, uh, folk like Ramesh who really got up uh, very early and uh, colleagues in North America who are sort of going past their working days. I really appreciate your, uh, your, your flexibility in joining us. And uh, let's take this forward and make these futures happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wing. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. See you later. Okay. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.